Ladies and gentlemen, Free Pack welcomes Glenn Beck. And uh, the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreached Well, hello. I'm here to bring you a message. I'm a Texan for Bevin. I am, uh, I'm here to tell you, last night I was reading my scriptures and uh, something popped out at me and it's in the book of John and it's talking about, I'm just doing this to really piss uh, Matt Kibbe off because he's, he's such a godless heathen, but uh, <laughs> it's in the book of John and in the book of John they're talking about how Jesus appeared and how things started happening. And the phrase is, and it was the beginning of miracles. I testify you to, to you today, this is the beginning of miracles. We have planted seeds, we had watered, we have stood, we have done everything we can. As long as we do everything we're supposed to do and stand exactly, exactly where we're supposed to stand, He'll do the rest and stand back and watch the arm of God. So, I brought some stuff with me today. And it is the story of where we are and how we got here. Through Mercury One and my... Uh, personal foundation and David Barton, we are trying to collect the important pieces of history and preserve them to make sure that they are never ever lost so that the, the story of America can be told. This is the actual microphone used by Tokyo Rose. This, this microphone was taken by um, a, a Navy officer who went and sailed all over to, uh, all on his way to Japan, and he thought, I'm going to kill her, and I'm going to burn it down to the ground. And when he got there, Tokyo Rose was already gone, but he burned the radio station down, and he burned the studios down, but before he did, he put this in his duffel bag. We just acquired it. It had never been spoken into until recently. We just repaired it. And I was in the back room of our studios in Dallas, and they said, okay, you want to test it? And I said, wait, wait, unplug it. What should be said? What should the first words heard from this microphone, what should those words be? And so the next day, I got into the radio station in the studios, and we plugged it in, and we didn't know for sure if it would work. And we plugged it in, and I'd been thinking about it all night, and the words that I spoke into it was this microphone belonged to Tokyo Rose. And if she could say anything to the American people today, she would say this, I am innocent. Most people don't know that Tokyo Rose was pardoned by Gerald Ford in the 1970s. She was pardoned because she was innocent. She was actually trying to help. There were five Tokyo Roses. The one that we put in jail was actually an American citizen who had come over to Japan to visit some relatives when December 7th hit and she was trapped. And they forced her into service. But what they didn't know is all the time she was taking foodstuffs and medicine to some of our POWs. She was working with some of the trapped Americans to send covert messages over the air. Some of our boys were on islands, and she would say, if you happen to be in these islands, you might as well go to sleep tonight early, because you may not have a restful night in the wee hours of the morning. And our soldiers would say, wait a minute, is she just saying that they're going to attack us? 
She saved lives. But we put her in jail. And the reason why we put her in jail is because the media wanted a story. Time Magazine went over to Japan, and all they wanted was a story about Tokyo Rose. Well, she couldn't afford to come home. She was excited to tell her story. She was excited because she fought for us. She told the story to Time Magazine. That's not the story they wanted. They printed something entirely different and made her into a villain. She was persecuted over in Tokyo because she was an American in Tokyo. And then when she finally scrapped up enough money to come over here, come home to the country she loved, we persecuted over her here. In fact, it was the most expensive trial in American history. And much of that had to do with bribes. And our servicemen actually felt horrible about 15 years later, after she had gotten out of jail, out of prison, an innocent woman, and they started telling her story. And no one has had the courage to tell the story since. Tokyo Rose was innocent. Now, how did that happen? That happened because media and big government decided they needed food. They needed some story to tell. And unless you have somebody in the media, unless you have organizations that are, are true to the truth, unless you have people in government that are true to the truth, it happens again. These are the shoes of a woman named Rio Soto. She was also an American citizen. She was born in... Um, by the Presidio in San Francisco, California in 1912. She wore these, American citizen, she wore these to the internment camp. She was a famous artist of her day. We rounded her up and we put her on a bus with her family and her shoes and we made her live in a horse stall at a racetrack in Southern California for six months while we built an internment camp. And then we sent her up to Wyoming where the wood, the slats between the, the uh, siding was, had holes in it about that thick. She was wearing these shoes all winter long in Wyoming. I have received much of her estate all of her artwork that was in museums at the time of the internment. And then I received the things that she did after. When they finally let her out, she went to work for the United States government to help produce schematics of our planes so we can build planes. Her children gave it to me because they thought they needed to be preserved. The story needed to be told because they didn't even know the story. When she was getting ready to die, she gave them and she said, I want you to know, please don't let this hurt the image of your country, but this is what I endured. They were shocked because she was the most patriotic woman they had ever met. It didn't change her view of the country of the founding documents. She knew that it was a violation of those founding documents. It was the people that lost their way, not the principles behind the country. When you stick to the principles, it's a glorious place. Much of the stories that we have in America, we don't know for a reason. Very few people, I just gave a speech in uh, Hollywood with the Friends of Abe, they're all, of the, they're all the blacklisted Hollywood people, and I will tell you, it is not a secret organization, it is a private organization, but you'd be, you'd be very heartened to see the faces and the names and the number of people in those rooms when you go to speak to them. But I held up this cane, and I don't know if anybody here will know who it was, but they did. This is the cane from D.W. Griffith. D.W. Griffith um, was, the, um, was the producer of the first movie ever to actually be run in the White House. Anybody know what the name of that movie was? Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation. That was the story of the Klan. 
And it was, what people don't understand is, it was saying that the Klan was a good thing. And that was, the, the, the Civil War was the birth of a strong nation, the Klan. Not a lot of people understand that that was the viewpoint of our president, President Woodrow Wilson. I hate that guy for a reason. <laughs> Not a lot of people know this, he resegregated our military. We didn't have a segregated military until Woodrow Wilson, and he segregated it. The guy that every, uh, every uh, uh, professor will tell you is one of the top five presidents of all time. The guy was a monster. He segregated the military of the United States of America. And why do I bring up D.W. Griffith? Because the story comes from this book, The History of the American People, by Woodrow Wilson. Wilson is the one who wrote that. But again, we don't know it. We don't know our own history. This is a very rare book from uh, Thomas Edison. This was Thomas Edison's book um, when people were investing in uh, what would become the motion picture. And I just want to read the last page to you, or a little bit of it. He said, our methods point to ultimate success. No scene, however animated and extensive, will eventually be within our reductive, uh, re reproductive power. Um, uh, naval exercises, processions, countless kindred exhibitions will all be recorded for the leisurely gratification of those who are debarred from attendance or who desire to recall them. The invalid, the isolated country recluse, the harassed businessman can indulge in needed recreation without undue expenditure. So he's saying, this is going to be great. We have the motion picture and we'll be able to record it and all man will be able to see it because he says, Instead of dry and misleading accounts tinged with exaggerations of the chronicler's mind, our archives now will be enriched by the vitalized pictures of great national scenes. In other words, the motion picture will save history. Tell that to Oliver Stone. <laughs> Edison thought that because we had moving pictures, we'd be able to record history as it truly was. But Edison didn't really understand the progressive era. He also didn't understand the university system, and he didn't understand what the progressives could do to our churches. This is a book when we went into Berlin. The former Jewish scholars said, we have to go in. We know where the bodies are buried. We have to go in. It came from the universities. It was the universities that did this. We have to document it. This is the book of their documentation from Berlin in 1945. They said, these are the names and these are the people that did it. We had another group of people here in the United States trying to do much of the same thing. We already have it in our university systems. This is um, a series of lectures on social justice by Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin is a guy that um, I had been accused of being for a long time by the media, which is hysterical because, uh, let's see, social justice doesn't seem to be my bag. <laughs> but we had one thing in common. He had a radio audience. But that's where it ends. Social justice. You'll hear a lot about social justice preached by a guy to millions of Americans who turned out in the end to be a Nazi. You see, if they can just get social justice into our churches, if they can just get social justice into our movies, if they can just pervert it in our universities, they got it. They've done it before, over and over and over again. And nobody's learning the truth George Bernard Shaw, he's a good guy, right? Thank God you know that. George Bernard Shaw, I, I, I mean the George Bernard Shaw Theater in New York City. You gotta be kidding me. You know what a monster that guy? That guy was the guy who came up with the idea of the gas chamber. This is his, now listen to the way this is worded, I love this, this is his, one of his books. The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism. And you dummies can read the rest.
George Bernard Shaw was the guy who said, certainly we all know a few people that their life isn't worth living. We just line them up and say, sir or madam, justify your existence. And if they can't, well, there must be some way to use some gas. The Germans came up with it. It is the Fabian Socialist. It is the National Socialist. It is the socialist movement around the world that gave us this. We all know this. That just meant you were a Jew. But this one meant you were asocial. You were a Jewish person, but you were also asocial. Uh, that could mean that you were homeless or you were an alcoholic. This one was you're an immigrant. This one uh, meant that you were um, a career criminal. This one is interesting because they were the ones who guarded all of the other prisoners. The career criminals, these were the worst of the worst, and they would sometimes get a badge like this. This is actually a, a police badge for the ghettos of Warsaw. Worn by a guy who had this. They always give, think about the world that we're creating now in America. You always give the power to the worst of the worst because they'll enforce it. This one meant that you were a Jewish criminal. This one we all know is homosexual. This one meant that you were a communist or a capitalist. Wait a minute. National Socialists didn't like capitalists and didn't like communists. Let me tell you something. Socialists and progressives are nothing more than communists with patience. That's it. But this, this is a rare badge. It wasn't rare at the time. We just don't know about it. This is the triangle you received if you were a Bible scholar. You have to wipe God out. Because if you wipe God out, you can do anything. You wipe God out, then man gets to be God. Man has the power. So where are we headed? Where are we headed as a nation? It's not hard to figure it out. By the way, I just the way you're looking at me, do you work for Mitch McConnell? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who here works for Mitch McConnell? Because we know you're here, and it's great to have you here. No, it's all right. No, it's okay. You feel free to stand up. It's good to have you here. Your, guy, your guy's going out of business very soon, but... And the reason why... The reason why Mitch McConnell needs to be sent home packing and wear some big Bermuda shorts out on the golf course someday is uh, because he's been part and parcel of where we're headed. This is a book called The Road We're Traveling by Stuart Chase. Stuart Chase is a guy who um, uh, coined the term the New Deal. And when the president had um, uh, the documentary that he ran before his last election, The Road We're Traveling, I went, mm -mm. I know the American people don't know this, but I know this, and I know they know what the road we're traveling means written by Stuart, Stuart Chase. And Stuart Chase wrote this. Currently, we have something that we're headed towards we'll call X, which is displacing the system of free enterprise all over the world. Now, they didn't want to call it, before they were calling it fascism, because fascism is neat. But then Mussolini came up and they're like, uh-oh, we better not call it fascism, because that's bad. National socialism is bad. Communism is bad. So what are we going to call it? They didn't even know. They just called it System X. Remember, guy from the FDR administration. Uh, System X will be a free enterprise into System X, a strong centralized government, an executive arm growing at the expense of legislative and judicial arms, the control of banking, credit, security exchanges by the government, the underwriting of employment through armaments and public works, the underwriting of social security by the government, the underwriting of food, housing, and medical care by the government, the use of deficit spending to finance these underwritings, the annual balanced budget has lost its old time need, 
the uh, abandonment of gold in favor of managed currencies, the control of foreign trade by the government, the control of natural resources, the control of energy sources, the control of transportation, the, hay, uh, the, the railway, the highway, the airway, the waterways, the control of our farmlands. In this book, he says, it's too late to turn it back. It's coming. It's only a matter of time. We've planted all the seeds. I beg to differ. Now is the time to turn it back. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't turn socialism around, System X around, what frightens me is we're a very nationalistic country. We love America. We love the red, white, and blue. We cry at the Star Spangled Banner. It is easy to wrap yourself in the flag and say, I love America, and people will do anything. They got me on the Patriot Act 10 years ago. They can get you to do anything. We're not headed for socialism. We would head towards national socialism. And when you have nationalized socialism, you produce things like this. This is the last script signed by Joseph Mengele. This is a script from when he was in the national health care system this is when he was running the uh, children's hospital. This is a uh, prescription for luminol. Luminol is poison. Luminol is sleeping pills. This is what they were doing to the children who were undesirables, who we couldn't afford. People who are our greatest asset. Taking people and saying, enough, because we don't have enough for everyone. When there's a shortage, we have to ration, and then we have to make decisions. And for you to make that decision in your family is your business, but for the national government to make a decision in your family is wrong, and it leads to evil every time. And then, and then you are left in a position where there is no winning. You're left in a position where you have no options left. All options are insane. If you saw the movie Valkyrie, do you remember when von Stauffenberg came home and he was watching his kids in the um, library, and one of them had his hat on. That library in the movie, in real life, would have held this book. This is Mein Kampf, written um, from the library of von Stauffenberg. This is the guy from Valkyrie. This is the Tom Cruise character, the real life guy. When I purchased this, I will tell you that the reason why I purchased it the edges of the pages. You will see, you can dress up in any uniform you want, but if you haven't read the book, you aren't a Hitler supporter. He never read the book. There's not a single page that has been dog-eared, and because of that, he was left with no options. And so, he went and tried to kill Hitler, and this is the napkin from Adolf Hitler on the attempt on his life. It leaves you in the realm of insanity. I ask you, these are my scriptures, what do the pages of your scriptures look like? Make sure your scriptures do not look like his. Let somebody hold up your books, whether it is the Constitution or the Holy Bible, and say, there's no way. That guy believed every word in it. Look at how he poured over those words. Look how they poured over 
the, the scriptures of our country. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And with firm reliance on divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We have seen these times before, and history tells us a story. The reason why history must be preserved, the reason why Common Core has got to go, the reason why is because history tells us. This is a Koran from the Jefferson era. Thomas Jefferson, when we went to uh, fight the Barbary pirates, we were paying 30% of our national budget to bribes. And Thomas Jefferson came in and said, what, the, what, what do they want? One of his advisors says, well, they're Islamic. They don't want anything, sir. You're an infidel. They want you to die, pay or die. And so he said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, you have to read the Koran. Well, the Koran had just been printed in English for the first time in England, so they sent over for a Koran. He read it. And they published it. And they asked Americans, the United States government asked Americans, read it, read it. Know what you're fighting. In the most politically incorrect thing I could ever show you, and I've shown you some politically incorrect things today, uh, this is to the reader. It says right here on the front, to the reader. It's a warning label. And it says, after you read this, you will be amazed at the absurdities contained in this book. But the message was clear. We're going to fight them, but they believe this. And because they believe this, they will not give up. And at some point, they will come back. The minute you forget they believe this, they will come back. That was the message from the Thomas Jefferson era. And it's been erased because we no longer believe this. I ask you today, I, I will tell you, I, I met the guys you had speaking. Some of them I met several times. Matt Bevan I have not met. I've talked to him several times and I had a good feeling. But I am telling you, I believe that man was called of God. These are the people we have begged for. These are the men and women that we have prayed for. These are the people, I know you're the same as me. I am down on my knees every day. God, help us. Help us, please. He is. Now we have to go and convince our friends and our neighbors. They're here. They've arrived. Don't get tired. I told you at the very beginning, what this administration tries to do to you and what the progressives on the right, let me tell you something, Mitch McConnell is as big of a danger to this country as Barack Obama is. The progressive disease is in both parties. Big government is a philosophy in both parties, period. It is antithetical to the American system, period. We have prayed for these people, and they have tried to wear you out. Wake your friends back up and say, brother, sister, it is here. These are the beginnings of miracles, but it requires us to stand, and it requires us to get hit. This is this is the pocket watch that saved Joseph Smith's life. This is a pocket watch that one day they were trying to kill him. Mainly, you'd take all the church stuff out of it. They were trying to kill him because of abolition. They were abolitionists. That's the main thing that was going on. 
It was about slavery and power. And so three times in one day, they tried to get him. They uh, tried to tar and feather him twice in that day, tried to arrest him. The last time during the day, they tried to arrest him. And he and Brigham Young are on the back of a buggy, and the sheriff comes up with torches. He says, what is it this time, sheriff? It's like 9 o'clock at night. Pulls him down out of the carriage, said, I got you now, old Joe. You stole a stove. Now think of a stove. I mean, who steals a stove? Back then, too, they're big, lunky, heavy. It's not easy to get out with them. He said, what? No, he didn't. He said, I understand you owe $25 in the stove that you have. He said, you know that's not true, Sheriff. But just to settle everything, and he reached into his pocket, took out this watch, put it in the hand of the sheriff, and said, just to, just to make sure we're clear on everything, this will certainly cover the price of any stove I might have stolen, and I don't owe a man a dime. The man knew what he believed in. I challenge you to know what you believe in. And then hold fast to it. This is George Washington's compass. This is the, he was a surveyor. This is the only compass he had in his life. George Washington is my hero because he never, <laughs> he never did any of the things he wanted to do. He did the things that God wanted him to do. And, um, He was a man of exactness. And uh, one day, it was towards the end of my uh, stint at Fox when um, uh, we had the opportunity to not be men of honor. And it would have been very satisfying. And uh, I had a lot of people around me that were saying, do it. And uh, I knew it was the wrong thing to do, but I wanted to so badly. <laughs> and I got up that morning, and I went to my safe, and I took this out, and I put it in my pocket. And that particular episode, I had it all day long, and that episode, most of that episode, I had my hand in my pocket. And I had my hand on this compass, and all day long, I would just th <clears throat> think to myself, stay true. Stay true, stay true, stay true. But it was a miracle because I would not have found what I found on this compass. Will you come up for a second? Yes, you. You both can come up if you want. <laughs> come on up here this way. I found something on the edge of this compass that is remarkable. Right here, there is an indentation. This was with him at Valley Forge. This was with him everywhere he went. I believe he held it in his pocket and held it in his hand just like I did that whole day. And I found it in my hand and I was rubbing it like this. And as I put it in your hand, I want you to feel right there. Rub it. Do you feel that? It's right there. You feel it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fingerprint. It's a, it's a rub mark of of Washington. Feel it? Is that amazing? Awesome. The man, the greatest man. All right, give it back to me. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. The man, the greatest man of our country was no different than you and me. Stay true. Stay true, stay true. Finally, this is the original perspectives of Disneyland. And this, I'm a huge fan of Walt Disney. And Walt Disney, what he did, what he did with Davy Crockett alone was so well worth his life. But it went awry someplace. 
This is the prospectus. He brought this in to bankers. He told the, um, he told the guys um, in his office, he said, I need you to come in over the weekend. It's called the weekend prospectus. I need you to come in the weekend. I need you to work this out with me. I'm going to tell you what my idea is. His secretary typed it out, and his main artist um, drew it out, and then he hand-colored the painting that is in here um, of Disneyland. I can't open it up, but, um, but this had never been seen before. This um, prospectus had not been um, the actual drawing. You can find it on the internet, but what's inside of this had never been seen before, never been reproduced. This was actually brought into a bank in 1953 when no one would give him any money for Disney. And, uh, and so he said, get together, guys. We're going to make this, and I'm getting on a plane, and I'm going to Monday. I'm going to be in three banks on Monday, and I'm coming home with the money. He needed $17 million. Well, he went to all three banks. All three banks said no. He left it at the last bank. The um, banker came home, brought it home to his kids, and said, kids, look, I want to show you what Walt Disney wants to do. He was in the bank today. He's trying to get in. The kids were like, did you give him the money, Dad? And he's like, no, that's a crazy idea, but look. And it sat on a shelf. I just want to read this one phrase because this is what I feel I have been called to do, but I think it's a challenge to you as well. Disneyland will be based upon and dedicated to the ideals, dreams, and hard facts that have created America. It will be uniquely equipped to dramatize these dreams and facts and send them forth as a source of courage and inspiration to the world. Disneyland doesn't do that. If it, they're trying to do it subtly through the sale of plush toys, maybe. <laughs> but I challenge you to know the hard facts, the ideals, the ideas that created this country internalize them, know what they are, live them, preach them, live them every second, stay true, and send them forth as a source of courage and inspiration to all of the world. Thank you. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, Free Pack welcomes Glenn Beck. And uh, the world will be better for this That one man, scorned and covered with scars Still strove with his last ounce of courage To re Well, hello. I'm here to bring you a message. I'm a Texan for Bevan. I am, uh, I'm here to tell you, last night I was reading my scriptures and uh, something popped out at me and it's in the book of John. And it's talking about, I'm just doing this to really piss uh, Matt Kibbe off because he's, he's such a godless heathen. But uh, it's in the book of John, and in the book of John, they're talking about how Jesus appeared and how things started happening. And the phrase is, and it was the beginning of miracles. I testify you to, to you today, this is the beginning of miracles. We have planted seeds, we had watered, we have stood, we have done everything we can. As long as we do everything we're supposed to do and stand exactly, exactly where we're supposed to stand, he'll do the rest and stand back and watch the arm of God. So. I brought some stuff with me today, and it is the story of where we are and how we got here. Through Mercury One and my uh, personal foundation and David Barton, we are trying to collect the important pieces of history and preserve them to make sure that they are never ever lost 
so the, the, the story of America can be told. This is the actual microphone used by Tokyo Rose. This, this microphone was taken by um, a, a Navy officer who went and sailed all over to, uh, all, on his way to Japan, and he thought, I'm going to kill her, and I'm going to burn it down to the ground. And when he got there, Tokyo Rose was already gone, but he burned the radio station down and he burned the studios down. About 15 years later, after she had gotten out of jail, out of prison, an innocent woman, and they started telling her story. And no one has had the courage to tell the story since. Tokyo Rose was innocent. Now, how did that happen? That happened because media and big government decided they needed food. They needed some story to tell. And unless you have somebody in the media, unless you have organizations that are, are true to the truth, unless you have people in government that are true to the truth, it happens again. These are the shoes of a woman named Rio Soto. She was also an American citizen. She was born in, um, by the Presidio in San Francisco, California in 1912. She wore these, American citizen, she wore these to the internment camp. She was a famous artist of her day. We rounded her up and we put her on a bus with her family and her shoes, and we made her live in a horse stall at a racetrack in Southern California for six months. But before he did, he put this in his duffel bag. We just acquired it. It had never been spoken into until recently. We just repaired it. And I was in the back room of our studios in Dallas, and they said, okay, you wanna test it? And I said, Wait, wait, unplug it. What should be said? What should the first words heard from this microphone, what should those words be? And so the next day, I got into the radio station in the studios, and we plugged it in, and we didn't know for sure if it would work. And we plugged it in, and I'd been thinking about it all night, and the words that I spoke into it was this microphone belonged to Tokyo Rose. And if she could say anything to the American people today, she would say this, I am innocent. Most people don't know that Tokyo Rose was pardoned by Gerald Ford in the 1970s. She was pardoned because she was innocent. She was actually trying to help. There were five Tokyo Roses. The one that we put in jail was actually an American citizen who had come over to Japan to visit some relatives when December 7th hit and she was trapped. And they forced her into service. But what they didn't know is all the time she was taking foodstuffs and medicine to some of our POWs. She was working with some of the trapped Americans to send covert messages over the air. Some of our boys were on islands, and she would say, if you happen to be in these islands, you might as well go to sleep tonight early, because you may not have a restful night in the wee hours of the morning. And our soldiers would say, wait a minute, is she just saying that they're going to attack us? She saved lives, but we put her in jail. And the reason why we put her in jail is because the media wanted a story. Time Magazine went over to Japan, and all they wanted was a story about Tokyo Rose. Well, she couldn't afford to come home. She was excited to tell her story. She was excited because she fought for us. She told the story to Time Magazine. That's not the story they wanted. They printed something entirely different and made her into a villain. She was persecuted over in Tokyo because she was an American in Tokyo. And then when she finally scrapped up enough money to come over here, come home to the country she loved, we persecuted over her here. In fact, it was the most expensive trial in American history. And much of that had to do with bribes. 
and our servicemen actually felt horrible 